Now, see, we will talk about ZPR3. I worked on that too. The gist is that this is called a critical assembly. Now, I don't know what that means. It means it never goes to power. This is a critical assembly to, t to test the theory and the knowledge that the physicists had for composing a variety of fast reactors. They weren't very good at it. And so here is a machine that allows them to actually load simulations of a real, real reactor as for relative content of the various materials, aluminum, zirconium, um, coolant, sodium, all these combinations. And this was done in the ZPR building, and it's no longer here. It was a building to the uh, east of this building here. It was a nice building. I had an office down there for a while. Um, this would, uh, I think there was a half a dozen physicists there. Each one of them was an assignment. They weren't involved with this reactor. They were involved there to see if they could calculate and predict what would be the combinations that would work this way and that, what their characteristics would be. And so this is put together in two halves with drawers, two by two by oh, several inches long. And we'd load these drawers full of little pieces of metal of different kinds, enriched uranium included. We dealt with a lot of enriched uranium. And, you know, today that would be <laughs> kind of unthinkable. Natural uranium as well for blanket, aluminum, and even canned sodium. Well, we had uh, sodium contained in quarter inch by two by two ca capsules or a place to put in there. And it was made in two halves, and so when you get, when the, the physicist thinks he knows how it's going to work, and he's predicted it, and, they've, and he submitted it to his supervisor, he's allowed to go and actually load those drawers the way he thinks it'll be, and we, we involve all of us guys, including me, to load those drawers and put them in there, insert them in there. Then the halves were driven together uh, hydraulically, to where they actually would touch, come together, tied together in the middle. Then we had those control rods, which were really moving drawers of fuel, and you see there's some on both ends. As you put the, uh, that uh, control rods in, now on a fast reactor, it's always insert the rod, causes you to go to critical. The opposite of a water reactor, which is use poisons. And when you bring those halves together and start running the control rods, and then you had a control panel just about like this one here, with no coolant, but uh, all the other controls. And watch the thing come up to power and uh, find out how, how it behaved. And maybe have some gold foils to check the radiations around the, the neutron densities at the various locations around the peripheral, peripheral perimeter of the core. Now you also notice that there's two cylinders down there on the right hand side at the bottom. Do you know what a source, neutron source is? QB. Yeah. Okay, do you know what a neutron source is? <laughs> well, even an atomic bomb has to have a trigger. And uh, when you bring these halves together, if there was no, uh, no stray neutrons around, there's no neutrons that have been generated artificially, it may take off and it may not, because it would take us, there's a few neutrons flying through the air all the time. And it would take a spare neutron from space to maybe get it started, and then it would multiply on that. Well, if you had it too far advanced when that happened, uh, uh, you'd find yourself not only critical, but more than critical. You don't want that. Okay, so one of the trick, tricks is to put it in an artificial neutron source. And there are a few reactions where you can get it. And the one that's used here was polonium beryllium. Um, polonium is a gamma emitter. Beryllium is a, when it hits with a, with a gamma ray, it'll throw off a neutron. So the two together comprise an artificial neutron source. And there's one for both, one each half. Okay, you don't like that neutron source busy while you're working on the reactor halves. You wait until you're ready to go critical. Then you inject the artificial neutron source to make sure, and enough so you can actually read it on the instruments, 
before the halves are all the way together. But you could somehow monitor the source so it wouldn't be too many, right? You don't want it to take off too fast. You want to make you want to have enough neutrons that you can actually measure them before you do anything. Oh. And then you'll see the multiplication on what is existing there. Now I think it's interesting that all the modern reactors today, not only one of them puts out superheat. You know what superheat is? You raise the water till it boils, and if it's steam, you can run it through a turbine. But if you want to get more energy out of it, you don't stop heating it just because it's steam. You heat it up another couple hundred degrees. Okay, now if you could see that, here is the steam generator right here, on the right. And this is the superheater on the left. And then uh, something that looks a little bit like it over on the far side, and that's called the economizer, that's preheater. So the, you go to steam in three steps. You take the water, heat it up, two, you take, convert it to, to steam, and three, you heat it still more. Now this reactor was producing superheat back in 1951 and there are no reactors out there today that does it. Oh, and down the hole there you can see the uh, feed water pump. If you look down far enough, it's way, way down there. I don't suppose you can see it very well. Okay, and here is the condenser which condensed the steam back to water, and here's the f um, condensate pumps here. I guess there's no light in there, huh? Well, this is where the... In this reactor, the, the reactor had primary sodium and potassium. It had a secondary system, which is also sodium and potassium. And then finally, that would take that and convert that to steam. Now, this is the heat exchange between the primary sodium and potassium and the secondary sodium and potassium. And we did have a leak in this unit right here. And we had to chip this whole area out here and go in there and make a repair. Now, that was not easily done. Um, when they opened up the end, they had to cut the wells off and found the tube sheet had ruptured. And now you're dealing with sodium, sodium potassium, out in the room with you. How do you suppose we did it? Keep your distance. Huh? I think you used alcohol, didn't you? Well, this is not radioactive. It's just it's a chemical problem. It's right. Not, okay, we squirted water on it. Huh, okay. And washed it out. You know, until it was quit reacting, and then we went in there and fixed it. Then put the concrete back in place. Now, these are valves to run the valves on those. But you see, you have manual ways to override them as well. See this? This overrides this, this overrides this. Okay, this is the gas system for blankets. It was controlled from here. And there'd be bottle, lots of bottles of gas bottles right along here to feed into the system. Okay, here is the artificial neutron sourced container. And there's two of them, you see. And it has a, a cable with a plutonium beryllium source on the end of it. And so when you got ready to run the reactor, or the assembly, you'd clear the room and inject with the controls to run that artificial source into the reactor. So that's basically a pig. Uh, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, that's what it is. And these would be the control rod drive mechanisms? Yeah, in fact, uh, Ralph Rice designed the this part, I designed this part right here. I designed the Selsen motor controls um, and these limit switches are my design. And here is, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> See the, the position indicator is noted by these Selsen motors, but you see it, it requires it that it moves in and out. See, it moves in and out. And this is a counterbalance, and that's not why we made it. That's a little, been a little bit modified. You don't have any sample drawers here. 
Well, there he is. <laughs> Here's a drawer right here. And that's Keith Dibbets and um, Oh, it'll come to me. And we load the drawers in and keep track of them. And you see, he's, in, he's inserting the drawer here. And they're loaded not at the, on the spot. They're loaded in a different room. Uh, they have pretty high security, even in those days, on enriched uranium. And so you'd have a catalog to, to load it. And you had to check it, check it to make sure it was loaded correctly. <coughs> And this picture was actually taken in National Geographic, but it never got put in the National Geographic. And um, Peterson, Ted Peterson, is that guy. He's deceased too. I don't know about Keith Tibbetts. He might. He's a little older than I am, but he might still be alive. So this is a way for the physicists to see if they can calculate and model. That's what it is really all about, modeling. You know, the weathermen have models of what the weather is going to do, and then they wait for the weather to come and see what it really does. Okay, in this case, they're modeling what they think the reactor is going to do, then they go check it and see if it does it. Is this a shield block here? It is. But we didn't use them. I don't know. Really? Might have been used late in the game. But, uh, well, there is a chance. See, I think many people like to forget this. We actually had a plutonium core in this thing once. Plutonium core. Now, it's unthinkable now. You wouldn't do that now. Because the plutonium was clad uh, two by two by quarter inch plates, stainless steel clad chunks of plutonium. And as long as they were clean on the outside, we could handle them. But if you ever had a rupture, it was going to be big news. And this was in the other building, and it had a air controlled vacuum system airlocks. So where this was taking place, technically uh, it was all we had vacuum pulled on the whole structure. And if you had uh, if you had a small leak, the vacuum system would pull everything into some CWS filters, very high high quality filters to collect CWS? any but CW chemical welfare Warfare, warfare service, CWS. Okay. <clears throat> so that building had the offices on the front part and you had the air cell on the back. And when you go in there, you had to go through an airlock to get to it. And they had a mechanism to count you in and count you out and make sure you didn't leave anyone in there. And it had a vacuum system in case you had a s small fire. But if you had a big plutonium fire, it was going to be bad news. And we found that we had some plutonium, uh, um, what do you call them, chunks. They were actually were getting little ripples on them, blisters on them. And our super chief from down there, uh, Fred Thalgett, he was a physicist, was very concerned about it. And we were really eager to get rid of that plutonium for fear that we were actually having some leakage because it's pyrophoric and it's quick to oxidize. And so if you had a leak in these clad, it might leak in and then it would expand. And if it expanded, it would turn to oxide. It would probably break the clad. It was only found out that that wasn't what the problem was. Uh, the, the plutonium came to us from, um, from Rocky Flats. And with checking with them, we found out that it was caused by oil contamination, which caused the blisters, not by leakage. So we never ever had a problem. But uh, you didn't have a problem; you just thought you had a problem. Yeah. Now it's possible they could have used these um, these shield blocks when they had plutonium core in there, because 
we were using cold, cold uh, f fuel, even our uranium was, you can handle it by hand. You didn't have to worry about radiation. There was no radiation involved. The only radiation I can think of when you were shut down, you know, you have a teensy bit of residual from running at five watts, but it don't amount to much. Right. Okay, but the real residual would have to come from those plutonium, uh, from that uh, neutrons artificial sources, or from the plutonium, which had alpha emitter. Now, in the instant, if you pick up those plates, they're warm to the touch. You're actually physically warm. If you ever had a, some plutonium, you could make a furnace. We didn't pay anything for fuel. If you're sure, it wouldn't rupture. Okay, now you see these halves are, one half is stationary, and the other half moves. It's on a, a lubricated V-shaped block. Just slides on it. Because the um, geometric accuracy is very, very important for an experiment of this kind. So they'd come together. That's ZPR3.